It's a bank with a tiny currency and a big job. This is one of two national seed libraries set up to preserve biodiversity and advance agriculture. And now a large part of that essential infrastructure is being sent to one of the most remote places on earth for safekeeping. 34,000 different types of grain and pasture seeds packed into more than 30 crates bound for Norway's global seed vault. If a disaster, natural disaster happens, like flood, fire, you know, bushfire comes through or something like that, and we lost everything here, if this, this building went up, if we didn't have it backed up anywhere, it would be lost. And there's globally unique material within these walls here. That backup will be stored in a freezer like no other. Halfway between mainland Norway and the North Pole is the archipelago of Svalbard. It's home to more polar bears than people. And the global seed vault is even less visible. Just a big steel doorway peeking out of the rugged white wilderness. When I went to Svalbard in 2014, it was a really almost an overwhelming experience because, I mean, it's, it's a massive sort of vault in the side of a mountain, so it's 100 and something metres into the mountain. So you're going in there and it's, it's just an eerie feeling in the context that there's agricultural diversity from around the world and this is agricultural history. So it was really kind of surreal. A decade after opening, almost 900,000 different types of seeds are now stored here. While it's dubbed the Doomsday Vault because it's essentially an insurance policy in the event of a disaster or major conflict, underground it's a harmonious resource. I guess when you go in there it's really quite interesting because you have um, you know, the US right next to Russia, you have North Korea right next to South Korea. The Seed Vault is probably the only thing I know that's there for the greater good. There's no politics involved. Sally Norton runs the Australian Grains Gene Bank at Horsham in Victoria, where Arctic conditions aren't exactly the norm. It's even though it's 30 degrees outside, we'll put our coats on. Well, what's the temperature going to be? Minus 20. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Looking forward to this. I feel a bit daft putting beanie on when it's uh, sweltering outside, but yeah. I'm sure I'm going to be very thankful for it in a minute. Okay. Some gloves? Yep. yep, gloves as well. All right, let's yep. go. Okay. It's a bit more clinical than the Norwegian vault, but the environment is very similar and crucial to the seed survival. Oh yes, that's a bit nippy. It is a bit cold in here. So how long do things last in here for? So things, uh, the winter cereals in here, the wheat barley, as long as it's good quality coming in, it'll generally last around about 100 years. And is that the case for everything then? No, not generally. So some of the high oil content seeds or the wild relatives don't last as long. So there's some wild relatives of wheat in here. Um, and they don't generally last as long. So how long would these last for? Um, these you might get 20 or 30 years before you might need to intervene, sometimes a little bit longer. Okay. This National Gene Bank was opened four years ago, bringing state collections of all types of grains, from cereals to legumes and oil seeds, under the one roof. This is a quite significant gene bank in terms of size and level of operations. So there's around 1,700 gene banks around the world. And there's probably around about 50 in terms of the size. We've got about 150,000 different types of seed in here. Unlike the Norwegian vault, Australia's gene banks do more than just store seeds. They grow them out. 2658, Kev. 2658. Yep. That makes for an eye-catching yeah. and uneven patchwork in the paddock come harvest time. Yeah. Last one. And more importantly, produces fresh seeds to deposit in the bank when stocks run low or the quality declines. Once seed arrives into our seed bank here, we have to keep it alive forever, and that's a pretty big job. Um, so I love that aspect of it, knowing that that's the history of Australian agriculture, but also the future of varieties that are going to be supporting uh, Australian farmers and essentially anyone who eats food. Steve Hughes runs Australia's other major seed library, the Pastures Gene Bank in Adelaide. A collection of more than 80,000 types of seed, some of which come from remote regions or crops that have now been wiped out. Even though it may originate from overseas, it's not maintained in another gene bank overseas. Um, so if we have a natural disaster at our gene bank here, the seed is lost forever. 
Um, the chances of ever going back to the original country and getting it again are remote. Which is why he's excited. Almost a third of his babies, as he calls them, are on their way to Norway. What we have really made a conscious effort to do is to capture all the commercial varieties that farmers have grown over the last 50, 100 years. So all the historical ones and all the ones that are currently growing now, um, and associated with them, we have um, all the, their wild relatives, I guess. First, though, Australia's third and largest delivery to Svalbard needs the green light from biosecurity officers. As well as securing the contents, the government seals on every crate allow Australia to retrieve the seeds quickly without going through quarantine. Local gene banks hope it's a withdrawal they never have to make, but it's not unheard of. You look at Akata in Syria, one of the most important gene banks in the world in terms of global diversity of pulses, was backed up in Svalbard. Um, when uh, the conflict started there, seed banks not able to operate. I think nearly 100% of that material was backed up into Svalbard. They've been able to take that out, grow it back up, and they're putting material back in. Turning what gene banks harvest by hand into something worth putting a full-size header through is a long ride. But one Wimmera grower and scientist, Tony Gregson, is helping to drive. We need new varieties with better disease resistance adapting to climate change. Um, I was only thinking today when I was harvesting this paddock. This paddock's been hit, hit by frost. And I, surely in someone's gene bank somewhere in the world, there's g g germplasm, genetic resources that have genes that are going to help with frost damage. They're a farmer's resource Mr Gregson has had a closer look at than most as well as visiting the Global Seed Vault and being good friends with its creator. He's also played a major role in getting collections out of Australia and into the Norwegian facility. And despite serving on many local and international agricultural boards, it's his part in the preservation of something so small that he says is his biggest career achievement. I think it's number one. I think it's, it, it is so important. It's, it's got long-term things that I'm interested in. It helps farmers in Australia. It helps global food security. It ticks all the boxes.